to this final session uh, before the concert of today. And this session is Musical Migration, Diaspora, and Multiculturalism. We have three fantastic speakers that are speaking on a variety of, of topics. Uh, first, Stephen Muir will be talking about Jewish music in South Africa. Gabriela uh, Jerahian um, will be talking about Ethiopian Israelis and the transnational circulation of Ethiopian music. And Serena Fati um, will be talking about Christian liturgical music in contemporary Rome. Uh, so first of all, we turn to um, Dr. Stephen Muir, who is uh, a senior lecturer in music at the University of Leeds. His research focuses on the music of Russia and Eastern Europe and Jewish musics, particularly in South Africa. Recent publications include Wagner in Russia, Poland, and the Czech lands, published by Ashgate in 2013, a chapter on South Africa's Jewish choral tradition for the volume The Globalization of Musics in Transit, Music Migration and Tourism, published by Routledge, also in 2013, and a study of Hasidic and uh, musical expression in 18th century Poland and Lithuania in the Journal of Synagogue Music. He's principal investigator for music, memory, and migration in the post-Holocaust Jewish experience, um, uh, a project at Leeds. And most recently, he's been awarded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council of the United Kingdom a large grant of 1.5 million pounds for a four-year project performing the Jewish archive from 2014 to 18. And I'm sure we'll be hearing much more about that over the next few years. So thank you very much, Stephen, and over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, it's uh, a really great pleasure, ple pleasure for me to be here at the conference. I'd like to thank the conference organizers for what's been a really excellent event, and I'm sure will continue to be so, uh, perhaps with the exception of the following 20 minutes. Um, I must also formally thank the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council for the grant that David mentioned that's paid for me to be here under the banner of that title, Performing the Jewish Archive. Um, like many of the papers at this conference, mine's about journeys. These are the journeys that Jewish musicians took from Russia and Eastern Europe to Southern Africa at the start of the 20th century, taking with them the cultural vestiges of the world they were leaving behind in the form of both their own and their friends' music, whether in manuscript form or as part of an oral tradition. Their journeys of individuals and their families, their life stories and career trajectories. These are journeys that illustrate both how music can appear to provide that um, sorry, can appear to provide religious practice with that patina of continuity that Kay so beautifully described in her opening keynote, but also how through processes of migration, both the religious and the musical are transformed. This is really only the beginning of the story or, or of many overlapping and interweaving stories, and much work remains to be done over the coming years, but I hope you'll find it of some interest. So first, a little bit of scene setting and orientation. Jews were almost certainly present in Cape Town when the very first European settlers arrived at the Cape in 1652. But the first organized communal body was not established until 1841, uh, when the Society of the Jewish Community of Cape Town, Cape of Good Hope, was formed. By this time, the British had taken control of the Cape, and although it contained a good number of German families as well, the community's character was essentially, in the words of Gideon Shimoni, a colony of Anglo Jewry. By 1880, the Jewish population of South Africa was approximately 4,000. But this grew rapidly with the arrival of large numbers of Jews from East Euro Eastern Europe, mostly from the northwestern part of the Russian Pale of Settlement, and even more specifically from the Kovno pr province that's now Kaunas, that largely equates to modern day northern Lithuania. A good number also came from Warsaw, and some also from southern Russia the area in which the Russian army took particularly close interest earlier this year, meaning I was unable to visit the archives there as planned. Thank you, Vladimir Putin. Um, the way that this wave of inward migration swelled the South African Jewish population from 4,000 in 1880 to nearly 50,000 in 1911 and then onwards, on, on and upwards, uh, leading some to describe the community now as a colony of Lithuania. This uh, incoming, sorry, the incoming Lithuanian Jews, or Litvaks as they're known, had a distinctive style of Judaism that foregrounded intellectual study and strict adherence to the letter of the Jewish law. And even though the historic battle between these Litvaks and their southern Polish Hasidic counterparts had largely dissipated uh, back in their homeland, 
it was still fe felt perhaps even more keenly in South Africa. The two main protagonists of my story today were part of that large-scale migration. They are Cantor Samuel Kibble from Kovno in modern-day Lithuania and Cantor Froim Spector from Rostov-on-Don near to the Ukrainian border in southern Russia. On the surface, their stories are extremely similar. Both arrived in Cape Town in 1928 and both, like most Jews arriving in South Africa at the time, travelled via Great Britain. Both had young families and the financial responsibilities that came with them. Both had previously been cantors in large synagogues and both had responded to advertisements placed by South African synagogues in the overseas Jewish press. But we'll look at the individualities of their stories in a moment. First, a note on my sources. A large amount of documentation is now held in the University of Cape Town Special Collections, predominantly, predominantly the committee minute books and other such official archives of Cape Town's Hebrew congregation on the left, the Gardens Synagogue as it's known, and also the new Hebrew congregation, the Roland Street Synagogue, which is no longer a synagogue. These were the synagogues where Keeble and Spector first served upon arrival in Cape Town. In addition to these formal archives, and perhaps of even greater importance, are the informal archives retained in Cape Town today uh, by the descendants of these two cantor composers. These informal archives have, been, have formed a large part of my research, even whilst they are currently kept in shopping bags, in spare rooms and attics. In addition, I was also able to interview the families concerned. They themselves are archives, of course, living repositories of memories, stories, anecdotes, as well as the generous providers of the physical documents I've described. So what did all this source material tell me about the impact of migration upon these two characters, and conversely, their impact upon the religious communities into which they arrived? The minutes of the Cape Town Hebrew Congregation Committee show that from November 1926, the synagogue sought a third full-time minister to occupy the position of second reader, or assistant cantor. An advertisement was drawn up in mid-1927 and placed in the Jewish press throughout South Africa and Great Britain, including this version sent to the London Jewish Chronicle. The Garden Synagogue was the, lar the last great bastion of anglo jewry in Cape Town in the light of all the East European immigration and fought to re retain its distinctive English style, hence looking to England as a possible source for a new cantor. With the assistance of Chief, Ra Chief Rabbi Hertz himself, a short list was drawn up from the 45 applicants, with Samuel Keeble of Cardiff, Wales at the top. Because importantly, Keeble had remained in Great Britain for several years after his initial departure from Kovno, giving him a rather different status in the eyes of his future employers in South Africa. By January 1928, the deal was done and Keeble was appointed. He finally arrived in Cape Town with his family on the Windsor Castle steamship, on the 7th of May 1928. He remained in his position until 1939, when he was finally dismissed. Documents held by the Keeble family, alongside the official archives of the Garden Synagogue, attest to a colourful period of office in which conflict between Keeble and the synagogue authorities was never far away. Often the reasons for conflict were extremely mundane, but the family account speaks of far more resentment regarding this than could ever be recorded officially. Wranglings over money and contracts began even before Keeble arrived in South Africa. For example, the synagogue committee refused to, to confirm payment of passage for his wife and children until his arrival in Cape Town, leaving him severely out of pocket with no guarantee of reimbursement. There were also disagreements amongst committee members as to whether or not the house provided for him should be renovated, and I quote, in order to make it habitable. In addition, he was charged rent for the house, whereas the other members of the clergy already incumbent were not. Just as importantly for, for us here today, however, is an indication of how what seems to us small changes in musical practice became amplified and exaggerated into major causes of conflict, and ultimately of Keeble's dismissal. The main problem for some members of the synagogue committee appears to have been Keeble's inability, or perhaps unwillingness, to adopt a more English style of biblical cantillation, laning, or, and prayer intonation, the nusach. Despite his stay in Great Britain, Keeble had never absorbed the subtly different melodic inflections of, of the English style, the minhag anglia, preferring instead to retain the somewhat similar but nevertheless distinctive melodic tropes of his native Lithuania. 
The garden synagogue at the time reti retained a style of cantillation, now more or less obsolete, except in parts of Great Britain still. And even that is now something of a hybrid. Keeble's inability to adapt to the style acceptable to his new congregation was ultimately his undoing. In this case, it appears at first glance that migration and new musico-religious requirements were irreconcilable. But there is an ironic twist. It was Keeble's introduction of the musical colouring of his former congregations that's now most fond fondly remembered. Earlier this year, one of the present-day Cape Town cantors, Ivor Joffe, told me, ours is a, is a distinctly Lithuanian nusach, and we're really proud of that heritage. So whilst musical and religious requirements and perhaps abilities came into direct conflict, ultimately leading to Keeble's dismissal, his approach was eventually to change the accepted manner in which the leading of the services was undertaken in this most proudly English of institutions. Migration had, an, had yet another profound impact upon Keeble in that it afforded for him the opportunity of formal musical education at one of the foremost English institutions of the day, Trinity College of Music, from where he gained the Licentiate Diploma, or LTCL, in 1920. This qualification, above all, probably secured him the position in the Cape Town congregation, who were extremely impressed by this high level of musical education. Perhaps in, in point, appointing someone from Cardiff with an LTCL diploma, they thought, with apologies to the Welsh, that they were getting an Englishman. But they essentially got someone steeped in a different tradition, even while his stay in Great Britain had changed Keeble's technical facility in and approach towards music. Keeble's surviving manus manuscripts amount, amount to a huge repository of music, at least 60 manuscript notebooks of a similar nature to the one shown here. I have to admit to being rather overwhelmed by the volume that is there is to look at. Um, and indeed other separate manuscript folios and individual sheets. Some of the books contain transcriptions of music by other prominent synagogue composers from Eastern Europe, but most of it is original music by Keeble himself, or sometimes arrangements of music he'd known from childhood by his father. On several occasions, Keeble acknowledges the influence and importance of his father over his musical upbringing. In this example here, we see how he cites his father as the source of a, a melody, a Hasidic nigun that Keeble later worked into a composition of his own. Here we see an attempt at combining a, a, a melody from his father uh, with one of his own, contrapuntally. From conversations with Samuel Keeble's son, we know that, uh, uh, Professor Morris Keeble, we know that Samuel Keeble's father, Moshe Aron, was himself the latest in a long line of cantors from Poland. What's surprising is that Keeble managed to introduce such Hasidic melodies into the choral and cantorial repertory of the proudly English Garden Synagogue, a synagogue, I should add, that had largely shunned East European immigrants when they arrived in the Cape. But ironically, some of Keeble's father's Hasidic Polish melodies are still used in the Garden Synagogue today. Contradictions abound plentifully here. The type of musical materials that Keeble attempted to, int to introduce and which caused such a vehement reaction on the part of the synagogue committee were, were ultimately adopted almost wholesale and remain today, proudly proclaimed as emblems of the community's distinctive Lithuanian heritage. But if you know anything about European Jewish history, you'll also know that equating a Lithuanian heritage with Hasidic, with Hasidic melodies is about as contradictory as you can get. Why Keeble, a Lithuanian Jew, tried to introduce Hasidic melodies seems initially illogical, until one remembers that his father was probably born in Łódź, which had become a centre of Hasidic teaching. But that's an even more complex story for another day, I think. So that's a small insight into the life and music of, Sm of Samuel Keeble and how migration provided him with the opportunity of musical education and a brighter future in a new land, but at the same time frustrated him musically and ultimately deprived him materially yet also led to a legacy that would long outlive him. My other case study, Froem Spector, also passed through Great Britain en route to Cape Town in 1928, but only briefly, and was employed not by the English-dominated Garden Synagogue, but by the predominantly Lithuanian Roland Street Synagogue. We know from documents that survive in Spector's beautifully ornate manuscript folder pictured here, that he took up the post of Cantor at the Grand Choral Synagogue in Rostov-on-Don in 1915, apparently against stiff competition. Some of the documents provide fascinating social and religious information about the wider community at the Grand Choral Synagogue. 
This document, you, you, you won't be able to read it, I suspect, for example, from Froem's eldest son, Ellis, to his son, Kenneth, mentions that in, um, in 1913 to 14, Grandpa Froem, young, newlywed, at the height of his powers as a chazan, entered and won an international competition. His reward, the post most prestigious of Oberkantor at the premier choral synagogue, Rostov-on-Don. Choral, because its choir included ladies, ex-opera, and conducted by a professor of music. Premier, because the Jewish community of the city was divided roughly into three sections, and it goes on to explain that the premier choral synagogue served the upper classes. So, did the synagogue of Rostov-on-Don follow the reformist practices of communities in Germany and Austria in, or in ignoring the orthodox ban on female voices in the synagogue? Certainly, Jewish life in the nearby city of Odessa has been described by Dora Litani Littman as the most Western in character in the Pale of Settlement. Perhaps this rubbed off on nearby Rostov, as suggested by this family document, and indeed by his designation as Oberkantor. Musical evidence for the more progressive pr practices also exist. This setting, for example, of Vashomru, which dates from Spectre's time in Rostov, includes an organ accompaniment, and yet it's a piece performed on the Sabbath, when traditionally there should be no instrumental accompaniment. This speaks to one of the points raised yesterday or the day before about the prohibitions or not regarding use of instruments in the synagogue. It's specific to the Sabbath, mostly. Uh, the situation is far from straightforward and never really has been, as can be ascertained from this case. So why then did the quite strictly orthodox community of the Roland Street Synagogue in Cape Town hire a Rostov on Don Jew whom they might suspect, maybe, would not be as observant as themselves? The answer is simple, and that's cost. The committee of the Roland Street Synagogue initially to try, tried to get someone on the cheap. First advertising in South Africa and English, in the South African and English press, and eventually posting advertisements in the Jewish press in Eastern Europe when they received no initial response. In the end, ironically, they had to pay Spector the same amount as the previous incumbent. But by the time his contract was terminated in 1934, they'd managed to reduce this considerably from £60 a month to £45. Migration to South Africa was very much a double-edged sword for Spectre and his family. Whilst the Rostov Jewish community has suffered severe treatments in the 1905 pogroms and would later see most of its Jewish institutions close down under Soviet rule after 1917, day-to-day -day life, for some of the family at least, appeared to be going well. Certainly Froem's sons were most disgruntled at being torn away from the new and exciting pioneer clubs and sports guilds that sprang up, around, up, up after the Russian Revolution. Froem's granddaughter, Leora, recalls that her father, Ellis, that's Froem's eldest son, often talk of his, talked of his resentment towards Grandpa Froem at being uprooted from his childhood environment and whisked off to some strange foreign land where he knew no one and no one knew him. And because of their southern Russian origins, the family were never fully accepted into the predominantly Lithuanian congregation at Roland Street. Froem's granddaughter, Leora, again. Papa said they never really fitted in. They always felt like outsiders. Even as first cantor at the shul, Grandpa Froem was always looked down upon, shul is synagogue. So here, despite that patina of continuity that music might have, might have provided for Jews with apparently similar backgrounds, uh, be, uh, hoping to create a transnational connection back to a former homeland, the irreconcilable differences between diverging religious upbringings and the incompatibility of the musical approaches that went hand in hand with them soon brought about the termination of Froem's contract, and even sooner than Samuel Keeble's. It was in 1934 in Spectre's case. So despite Spectre's accommodations and the increase, increased levels of relig religious strictures that he must have had to accept, the arrangement did not work, and the final humility of having his salary reduced led to Cantor and Congregation going their separate ways. Spectre ne never really recovered musically or indeed religiously. He left the ministry soon after and opened, of all things, a biscuit factory in Cape Town. Uh, it's now a major tourist attraction, not because of Spectre, but for other reasons. Um, an occupation he retained more or less until his death in 1948. So we've seen, then, how the fragmentary archival rem remnants of two Cantor composers can give us some small insight into how migration provided one 
with the opportunity of musical education and a brighter future in the new land, even if coupled with musical and financial frustration, but ultimately leading to a musical legacy drawing on the musical traditions of his homeland and surviving even today. Whereas for the other, the family upheaval of migration coupled with incompatible musico-religious requirements ensured that migration was not particularly a happy thing. For the one, transnationalization was ultimately possible, if difficult. For the other, it ended up being a dead end. But there is a short postscript I'd like to add as well. For in this beautiful manuscript folder presented to Spectre on the 10th anniversary of his appointment in Rostov, uh, were also the fragmented remnants of other composers' music, including David Novakovsky, choir master of the Brody Synagogue in Odessa for 50 years and a major, major figure in the westernization of East European synagogue music. And also the music of David Eisenstadt, one of the main musical figures of pre-war Warsaw and also of the Warsaw Ghetto. Not only do these fragments attest to the close-knit transnational networks of cantor composers that existed before the Second World War, extending from one end of the Pale of Settlement to the other, but by taking the manuscripts to Cape Town, Spector inadvertently created an even wider network, and one which I and my colleagues will hopefully perpetuate by reviving and performing this music in a number of venues in America and Europe over the coming years. This music is now transnational, but it's also transtemporal, leading us back to a sonic world that was all but destroyed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for a fascinating paper and a, a, a beautiful case study of transnationalization of religion through music. Uh, we have time for questions. Hit me. Professor Chalamet. Thank you very much. It was a fascinating double case study. Probably the two really make a wonderful pair. It seems like they might have traded places at some times, yeah, at, yeah. at some point, doesn't it? Yeah. But it strikes me that this case study <coughs> also brings up some broader issues that it sure. might be worthwhile to talk about. I'm thinking about the ambivalent position of the musician, the very marginal position of both of these musicians, and you sketch the ethnic and other reasons, musical reasons, that this might have been the case, but I expect that many of us deal with musicians in service of religious orders who are themselves marginal. Rarely are these very, very high, um, what should I say, figures of, of, of high reputation or high admiration. And what I'm wondering is perhaps one of the reasons for the neglect of music in studies of the transnationalization of religion is uh, stems from the rather marginal position of the musicians themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, just a question I'm raising, and I'm wondering what you're thinking. It seems that that's implicit in what you're offering. Yeah, I, well, I mean, it's as you'll, you'll know from uh, Mark Slobin's work and others, uh, that the, the position of the cantor has been particularly, um, a particularly uh, unfortunate one uh, in history um, and has been denigrated and the office has been got rid of in many, many cases in the 20th century. There are, there are cantors around still, of course, but it's, a, it's a, perhaps a, a dying breed in its traditional sense, should, should we say. Um, it, what, what you said, uh, uh, um, remind me of a fantastic paper I heard at the Royal Musical Association's student conference many years ago, which was titled uh, The Organ Loft and the Closet, uh, which, which equated, um, this, it was a sexuality study in fact, but, but there were wider implications as well, which equated the church organist uh, with someone who, um, there's a physical separation in the organ loft, but there was also this sort of societal communal separation as well, with being wh whereby the, the organ loft was seen as a as a sort of symbol of this, of this marginalization. And, and also the fact that many, many uh, church organists, at least in this researcher's experience, were not Christian at all, and in, in extremely ambivalent and in large number of cases, atheist. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a very, very good point and a very useful one. Thank you, I shall incorporate that. Other questions? I have a non-musical question, mm. which is to do with the, the dress of um, the cantor in, in, in uh, the respector. Yeah. He's wearing a clerical collar, 
Yes. Um, no, that's Keeble. Oh, that's Keeble, sorry. Let me get the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I was somewhat surprised to see that. Mm. Uh, well, I think, I can't remember when the practice came in. It, it, it was a, a reformist, um, Haskalah type um, practice in order to appear more Lutheran, I guess, right. or, or more Christian, um, or more like Christians, rather. Uh, and to, to you know to to, to ad adopt the garb of um, Western uh, Christian um, clergymen was was part of the, the sort of along with arranging synagogues with pews that faced the front yeah. uh, and with introducing organs and choir lofts and all this sort of thing. So yeah, it goes a visible emblem of yeah. social rank, which is interesting from Keeble, who who was um, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting thing for him to to, to wear. Yeah as quite a, a religiously strict mm. uh, person. So, yeah, that's, in, that's mm. interesting. Probably because of his position in the garden school in, in Cape Town, which is this very, I mean, the um, one person I interviewed for a different study last year described the, the, the garden school as top, all, all top hat and tails, he said, in a South African accent, which I won't try and imitate, because um, I'll embarrass everybody. Uh, but he, he, yeah, he, this sense of Englishness is still there in the garden school even though at the same time they hark back to a, a, a Lithuanian heritage by drawing upon Hasidic music, which is about as, as non-Lithuanian as you can get. So there's lots of contradictions going on. So. More questions, comments? I'll try and shade my eyes so I can see uh, we've, we've stunned them into audience. submission. So. Uh, there's, there's a question over yeah. here. Thank you. It's a very superficial question, really. I was reluctant to ask, but about the manuscripts in which he'd written uh, his father's name. And I was just quite surprised, at least from our current generation, to see him write his father's name quite formally with the surname and initials. And so I wondered whether you are absolutely sure it was him that wrote it. And if it was him that wrote it, was he intending the manuscripts to be read by a wider audience and to be archived as they have been? Was he writing it with the intention of informing future generations? That's a very good question. I think, I mean, in, in answer to the second question, almost certainly not. This, this was his private inner workings, as it were. And I'm very privileged that his son, Morris, who's about 85, uh, has uh, allowed me to have not physical possession of them, but certainly sort of intellectual use of them uh, for, for my work. Uh, in terms of the, um, the manner in which he... The, the name is written. I, I, I'm pretty much 100% certain that it's Samuel Keeble who wrote that there, because really very few other people would have access to these books. Also, it's um, I guess it's a generational thing that be, being much more. I'm, I'm slightly surprised in, in he's sort of going the other way that he hasn't put um, Cantor or Reverend or whatever Maurice Keeble as a sort of extra formal um, assignation. But yeah, I think that's a generational thing. Is it? Good question. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. I, I think you. in the interest of time, we sure. need, now need to move to the next. Presentation.